Greetings, Floss Tube. Today is Tuesday, September 6th, 2016. It is exactly 5.55 p.m. East Coast time in the United States. Um, I know that I had said that I was going to do a video, some pro a progress video yesterday, but I got a little bit carried away with my stitching, and I was like, no, I'll just keep stitching, and I'll do a video tomorrow. So here I am. I wanted to show the brief little bit of progress that I made over the weekend. I didn't get quite as much done as I had hoped because Sunday I had a pretty nasty um, neck spasm that gave me a headache and I couldn't concentrate too well. So Sunday was more of a washout than I had hoped it would be. But in any rate, I did get some progress done, just not necessarily on the projects I meant to work on. So it was productive and yet not in the ways I wanted it to be productive this past weekend, but um, I also have a little bit of haul to show you that I purchased a few weeks back, um, and then I'll just ramble about some books and things I've read, so I'll leave that for the end of the video in case you just want to watch the cross-stitchy stuff and turn off the video after that. Uh, so, the first thing that I worked on this weekend, and I just got so carried away with it, but it tur it's turning out cute. The first thing I worked on was the Mill Hill Drum Christmas Ornament, which I'm making for my nephew because um, he's a drummer and he's really into it. So here is what the finished ornament will hopefully, some hopefully somewhat look like. Um, I don't know if anyone else has been stitching that, but um, it's really cute. I like that it's got the little star you stitch the drumsticks on the perforated paper separately and then tack them to the ornament. So um, before yesterday, all I had was the, the gold of the, the rim of the drum head and then the red triangles there. And this is where it stands so far. I have to say I'm very pleased. All I have left to do is finish stitching the beige and the drum head and then I can do the beading and do the drumsticks. Um, I just love the colors in this one more than anything else. Um, and I love the gold thread there, the, the metallic thread. I haven't used a whole lot of metallic thread in my stitching, but I really like how that sets off the drum. Um, and the beads for this one are just exquisite. And maybe I'm just all about the sparkle. I don't know, but the beads are so beautiful. I don't think they'll show up on the video here. Probably not. I turned off the light that I usually have on behind me because it's still daylight enough coming in there that in the window that I thought it would just be way too much light. So I hope you can see all right. Um, oh yeah, these will show up somewhat. Um, the glare on the bag is kind of bad, but so there's these little petite gold, uh, green, red beads, but these are the killer ones in my opinion. I love these. The bigger blue, green, and gold ones. Oh my gosh, those are just, I love the beads in this kit. So that was one of those things. I don't know. I know I hear a lot of people talk about when their stitchy bug deserts them, but yesterday I had the opposite problem. Mine wouldn't leave me alone. And I wanted, I was like in my head, I was like, okay, I need to work on Nutty Parade. I need to work on the Seven Dwarves. But I just got to stitch in this one while I was watching a movie. And it wasn't even, well, it was an okay movie. It was Terminator 3. Don't ask me why I was watching that. I think I was curious about how they sexed up a Terminator with, you know, the TX leather clad Terminator female. Kind of a denouement of the story that you couldn't stop Skynet. No matter what they did, they weren't going to be able to stop it. So the only thing they could do was survive the, the nuclear war that Skynet was going to cause. But. I guess it's kind of, Bill had a point when we were talking about it, he was like, well, if you, if you, if, if, uh, John Connor had killed Skynet, there would have never been the first two movies, so if you're, if you're going with the whole time travel thing, you couldn't screw around the time travel. Yeah, I was, I was bored yesterday. I watched that, and I started watching Rear Window and, um, Vertigo. I was watching Vertigo, and Bill wanted to watch Rear Window, which I had DVR'd when he got home, so we were watching that. That is a good movie. That is a really good movie. Um, and I've seen the remake with Christopher Reeve. 
So, but yeah, no, I was watching Terminator 3 when I was stitching. I was just like, you know, I can get this thing knocked out today. So I've almost finished it to the point where it'd be ready to be beaded. And then the other Melville kit I'm working on right now, I don't know if I have the... See, I try to keep my stuff straight. I try to be an organized stitcher, but it just doesn't work. Well, it does to a degree. I'm more organized about it than I used to be, but that's not exactly saying much. Well, I've lost the little, uh, you know, picture of the design, but this one everyone has seen. This is the Love Coffee ornament, and I just have to beat it. I just have to get it beaded and cut it out. And uh, I'm making that one for my niece, because even though she's 11 years old, she drinks coffee. Now, she drinks coffee the way I used to when I was a kid where it was just a little bit of coffee and mostly milk, but which is probably why I drink my coffee the way I do now. I do like two-thirds coffee, one-third milk, but she does drink coffee, so that's going to be her Christmas ornament. I got that finished, up to the beating point anyway. So I think I can put those two kind of off in my rotation. If I do anything with them, well, I doubt I'll take them with me on the trip this weekend because I think the next one is the one I'm going to take with me. Now, as an aside, which I should probably include this in my haul video, but I didn't exactly mean for it to be a part of Cross Stitch Haul. Um, I found this that I'm using as a project bag when I was in Northampton on, um, on Saturday. It's from a company called Blue Q, Blue Q Bags, and it's made out of 95% recycled material. It's a vinyl type bag, um, and it says on the tag that 1% of the sale of Blue Q Bags supports environmental initiatives around the globe, and that over $250,000 has been donated since 2009 when they opened their company. And the cool thing is that Blue Q Bags is uh, a Pittsfield, Massachusetts company, so that's like two hours from where I am so it's kind of like supporting a um, supporting a local business um, and this is the perfect size for a project bag um, I have to admit most of my projects are in gallon Ziploc bags but I thought it would be nice to try this as a project bag um, it's, it was only eleven dollars not that expensive um, it's very durable. I actually have a coin purse made out of made by this company that a friend of mine gave me a couple of years ago. Um, but it's it's a company. I'll leave a link in the description box to the Amazon page where they're all listed. But they make all kinds of bags. They make these big ones. They make little ones like this one, which I have all my correspondence for my needle miner giveaway in. I uh, wrote out. I took. I carried this with me to work today, and I've got cards in there for the first five ladies who um, sent me their addresses and um, so they make these two size bags they make messenger bags, tote bags, reusable like the grocery bag style tote bags um, coin purses, pencil pouches so I'll leave you a link. I didn't intend to buy this as a project bag but it just kind of happened there's one they've got that looks like an evidence bag for a murder scene that's kind of cool too. They've got all kinds of quirky, you know, different kinds of designs, but I'll leave the link. So, now I know you know the saga of the rainbow pooping unicorn, and I have to say, I never, oh, how did I do that? Something sticky on my scissors here. But I never thought I would be doing a rainbow pooping unicorn, but as I mentioned, my niece, is she's actually going to be checked into the hospital tonight with her cystic fibrosis tune-up. So, leave it to me to find a rainbow pooping unicorn. Um, now, I guess I started this two weeks ago this past, or it'll be two weeks tomorrow that I started this one. And I only had the mane and the unicorn horn done, so I probably put a total of at least four hours in on this on Saturday. I just didn't do it all like four hours at once because um, I kept, you know, doing other things, coming back to it. So I probably spent a total of about at least four hours on it. And what I decided to do is because it's a lot of fill stitching, I decided to outline the unicorn first and do the mane and the tail and the poop and then go back and 
fill in the body. This is as far as I got with it as of yesterday. It's the cutest thing. I've got like half the poop. Yep, cross stitching poop. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a video if I didn't get dirty somehow. But yeah, so this is how it looks so far. I'm stitching it on 14 count plastic canvas. And he's so cute. I got it from dailycrossstitch.com, so I'll leave a link to that site. It's a $3 pattern, no biggie. And I just, I, I just laugh when I do this one. So I hope that when my niece gets it, I think this is probably the one I'm going to take with me to work on Friday night at the hotel. Um, so this one, funny story, I took it with me yesterday to practice because they didn't have a formal practice yesterday with it being Labor Day. Labor Day. Normally what they would do is they would have the walkthrough on Sunday and Monday off and then do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practices. But because the schedule had, you know, classes hadn't started or anything yet, they were still on a different schedule. So yesterday they had a walkthrough. Um, but I went out to practice anyway, and I was sitting up top of the stadium with Bill. And the way our stadium, of course, it's like the traditional bowl shape that all stadiums are. But the top where he films from, there's an overhang on the roof. But then in the back, there's like an open space. So you can get this vicious wind. It's always, even if it's a light breeze, it's always windier up where he films from because there's like a cross wind that comes through. So I was trying to sit up there and I had taken, I just took this bag with me and I have my, you now my pattern and my uh, magnetic board and my scissors and all that in there. And I pulled it out and I started trying to stitch on it because I thought I could finish everything except for the fill in and then just work on the rest of that. Well, all of a sudden, a gust of wind came through and completely blew the pattern and my magnetic strips off my board. I was like, okay, this is not happening. So I worked a little bit on some of the fill-in, but it was so windy I couldn't sit outside and cross-stitch yesterday. So I didn't get as much done out there as I would have wanted to. And I didn't stay that long anyway because it was just a walk-through. But what I'm going to do is I've got this felt, this tie-dyed pink and yellow and orange felt. And I'm just going to, like I mentioned before, I'm going to use fusible webbing to put that on the back. Because I thought that that felt would go with the wild colors of the, of the unicorn. So I'm going to back it with that and send it to her in a card. So that, that was the last thing I really worked on. You know, my mind told me I should have been working on Nutty Parade and the Seven Dwarves, but I was working on Poop and Unicorns and drum kits and whatnot. So yeah, it yeah, it didn't quite go the way I thought it would, but I did get a lot done for what I did. Does that make I don't know if that makes sense. But anyway, so I don't have a lot in the way of haul, but I thought I would share it with you. Um, I thought I would share it with you anyway just to um, give you some idea of what's out there as far as Mill Hill kits. Now I've never actually finished a Mill Hill kit. I had one one time that I started and then I lost beads or something and I just never, that was when I was relatively new to the concept of beading and stitching in a way so I just didn't finish it. But I'm in love with the Mill Hill kits now that I've done the drum. Oh, and here's the picture of what the coffee one. I made a couple mistakes in it, but that's what it's supposed to look like once I finish beating it and cut it out and all. But I have to admit, I really like the Mill Hill kits. I love the colors, and I love the sparkle of the beads. Um, I don't anticipate the beads being that hard to work with. So I did do a curly girl Mill Hill pattern, which is a cross stitch that's done on fabric with beads to it. Um, that turned out nice, so i kind of becoming addicted to these. Now somebody, I can't remember who it was, but someone on Stitch Mania posted this one, and as soon as I found out that there was, that this was one of the Mill Hill kids, I had to get it, and I think it's going to be a birthday present for my nephew next year, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, it's not that big a project, so we'll see. This is the Mill Hill Buttons and Beads Camping Out. And I don't know if you can see it that well with the glare off the package, but it's um, 
you know, like a river, a tent, a campfire, a canoe. It's got a bear button, a duck. And my nephew is, he's a very, very serious Boy Scout. Um, this past summer, he was inducted into the Order of the Arrow, which is kind of like an honor society within the troop. Um, you have to have completed a certain number of week-long camping trips, done a certain, gotten a certain number of merit badges with the camping, th with, you know, the camping themes. Um, and he was the youngest in the history of the troop to be inducted, and there were only two other boys who were inducted with him. So that's really a big thing. And this camping, I, when I saw the person who was stitching it online, let's see, can I get it? Oh, I swear the lighting in here sucks. I think that's coming through the window. One of these days I will move to a house that has a decent, decently lit room that I can make my videos from. But anyways, oh, there you go. You can kind of see it there. So, oh, there it is. No glare on it now. So I just fell in love with this when I saw whoever it was who was making it on the Stitch Mania Facebook page. So I knew I wanted that for my nephew. Any excuse to buy a stash, right? And so then I bought the... Um, about the Mill Hill frame, you know, I got this stuff off 123 Stitch, and you know how they have the different hand painted wooden frames to go with the little buttons and beads series. So, um, I'm not sure about this frame. We'll see. I'm not sure how you secure. I mean, looking at this, I don't. See, I'm not quite sure I see how you secure the piece in the frame. But maybe I'm just missing something. But there's, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't need glass, but I just don't know how you secure the piece of cardboard in the frame after you, hmm, this may be a puzzle. Because, see, I mean, obviously your piece would go in here and there's a piece of cardboard, but how do you... I don't know how you get that to secure in. That is different. That is different than I thought it would be. Well, it may or may not go in that frame. I may just get a 6x6 six six frame at Michael's or something to put it in, but... Yeah, that's different than I thought it was. Ha! Ah, oh well. Can't run them all, right? So yeah, I did get this frame. I just don't know how you secure, I mean, obviously it's the right size for the piece and everything, I just don't know how you secure the, the backing in so that it doesn't all fall apart. Eh, I don't know. We'll just pretend like I understand how that works and we'll just move right along to my next kit. Now, this was one that I bought for myself because, well, you'll see why in a minute. Anybody who's listened to me go on about my bird feeder for more than, oh, the, oh no, I thought my squirrel was up on the bird feeder again. We have three solar globes right around our bird feeder, and the, the, I mean, he must be very smart for a squirrel because he's figured out if he hops up on the solar globe, he can then grab the feeder and just like stick his face in it. I thought he was up there now, but it's one of our birds. So anyway, I'm digressing. See, if I didn't do that once a video, y'all would be disappointed. So this one is one that I'm going to eventually do for myself. Well, you can see why. If you've listened to me go on for more than two seconds about my feeder and my birds, you know I love cardinals. Now, I am probably not going to stitch the Enjoy Nature, because to me that's a little cheesy, so I'll probably just make this whole strip here. Now i got to remember to go the opposite direction. Um, I'll probably stitch that whole strip in white just because Enjoy Nature seems a little bit cheesy to put on there. But um, this one just appears to be, this one is just a cross stitch. This does not have that many beads. Well, that's not true. The pine needles and the um, a little bit of green on the evergreen tree are, um, are with beads. So that'll be pretty. And in Bird Feeder News, I think my male cardinal is a daddy because he had a little baby with the name is Peyton. 
yesterday. Or juvenile, anyway. Maybe not a complete baby. But. And this is a Mill Hill kit that I bought a couple years ago when I was at Salty Yards in Ocean City, Maryland. And I just found it in my stash. I had forgotten that I had it. Um, it's the Football Hero kit. And I just think that's awesome. Touchdown score. It's got the helmet. Go team. You know, I don't know if I would keep this one for myself. I might stitch this one for my friend Leslie Ann, whose husband is the defensive coordinator. Um, I might give it to her. But at any rate, that's that's one that's been in my stash for a while. That's not a Mill Hill kit that I got recently. I'd say that's been at least two years. And the only other thing I bought from one, two, three stitch that day was a piece of <coughs> excuse me. 32 count cashel linen. It's the stormy night colorway. And I just got a nine a nine by thirteen. It's a nice kind of bluish gray. And what I think I'm going to do on this one is I have the Star Wars The Force Awakens Cloud fact, Clouds Factory pattern. And I'm going to start that so that I can say I stitched on May the 4th. But I'm going to make that for twin sons of a friend of mine who are really into all things Star Wars. And their birthday's not till next July. I think it's July 8th, if I remember correctly. So I've got plenty of time to work on it. But I just thought the, the gray fabric would be pretty for the Star Wars pattern. Um, so that just is going to go to my stash. I still have not heard hide nor hair from Silk, uh, Silk Weavers, Fabric of the Mountain. And I'm really pissed about that. Because, you know, if you can't meet your demands for a subscription service like that, either hire more people to help you meet the demand or just don't offer the subscription service. Don't get me started. All right, so that was pretty much the stitchiness there. Um, if you don't really want to hear me talk about anything other than cross stitch, now would be a good time to um, turn off the video because I'm going to go into a whole bunch of other different stuff. Um, and it wouldn't hurt my feelings any. Some people just strictly want to see cross stitch and other people don't care about it. So if you are leaving now, I will talk to you again soon. And if you're not, I thought I would first share a couple of books that I, well, one I just started and one that I'm almost finished. Um, I didn't realize until recently how much nonfiction I've been reading. Um, this first one I actually was reading when I was on vacation and I'm about to finish it. This is a very esoteric topic. But I think being the daughter of a man who worked in a paper mill for 42 years, it makes sense. And plus, with my love of all things paper anyway, it's called On Paper, and it's by Nicholas Basbanes. And it says the everything of its 2,000-year history. Well, the interesting thing about this book is it does delve into the invention of paper and who invented paper. And it's kind of a toss-up, you know, kind of a historical toss-up. Um, but it also goes into how paper shaped history. Um, it goes into the Stamp Act, which was where the British made us put, made us purchase all kinds of stamps to put on all kinds of goods. That was kind of the powder keg that ignited the spark of the American Revolution. Um, there's also an article, uh, there's a, a section in here about, um, what was it called? It was an operation during, Operation Mincemeat during World War II where they were trying to feed the Germans misinformation on where we were going to land in Italy. Because um, we were going to land in Palermo, Sicily. And we were trying to draw the Germans away from Palermo. So the Allies basically it was a Brit he was a British uh, submariner, I believe, if I remember correctly. I'd have to go back and look in the, in the chapter in the book. But he was a submariner who died while on duty of pneumonia. And um, so they decided that what they were going to do is they were going to take his body, make it look like he, because of course with pneumonia, he would have he looked like he drowned anyway. He had fluid in his lungs. 
So they were going to attach a suitcase with plans to his wrist and set his body adrift and hope that it washed up on shore and the Germans would find it and that they would then read the supposed communiques in the briefcase and be drawn away from Sicily thinking that what they had written about in the, the notes that he was supposedly carrying when he died was where the battle was really going to take place when we were really going to invade at Sicily, uh, Sicily of Palermo. And um, a kind of a gruesome story, but very interesting how paper played such a role in that because they had to create his whole backstory and give all the papers that he was supposedly carrying. And, um, and then, of course, it delves into the Pentagon Papers. Which, for those of you who are either not American or too young to know what the Pentagon Papers were, they were top secret documents about troop involvement, uh, troop movements and involvement in Vietnam. And Daniel Ellsberg uh, got his hands on them. He was the Eric Snowden of his day, basically. He got his hands on the Pentagon Papers, leaked them to the press, um, which was already, you know, covering all the anti Vietnam War sentiment. and. The anti-war sentiment just blew sky high when the Pentagon Papers were published. Um, and very much like Eric Snowden, you either think he's a hero or a traitor. I personally think both Ellsberg and Snowden are traitors. Um, but you don't come to this channel to listen to me talk about my political opinions. Um, but it talks about the Pentagon Papers and, you know, how that shaped an era and how the leaking of the Pentagon Papers um, shaped the relationship between media and politics. Um, the only part of the book that I haven't really enjoyed so far is I'm up to a chapter now called, well actually I'm on a chapter that deals with the young lady who was the Hiroshima victim who did the whole was trying to do the whole thousand cranes thing before she died of cancer and she made like 664 origami cranes and then that's become like a thousand paper cranes has become like a universal symbol of the desire for peace um and the whole like history behind origami and that kind of thing the only chapter i haven't really much liked is called the drawing board and it's basically about how paper had an influence on the impact of the growth of architecture as a career type thing, like, you know, how difficult it was for medieval cathedral builders because they didn't commit any of their plans to memory. They just knew what they were going to do and did it, and how that the use of blueprints and paper to create sketches and blueprints and things before you built something revolutionized architecture. It was kind of, that was kind of a dry chapter, but overall, if you're interested in, and it has a very, very tragic thing about 9-11, um, because there were so many papers that were blown all over New York City, all over Manhattan, and there's one about a note that a man who was trapped in one of the stairwells wrote that miraculously made it to his family. Um, but yeah, it's... It's a very interesting book. I mean, like I said, I had a vested interest in it because my dad worked in a paper mill for 42 years. So, yeah. It's a, it's a good book, though, if you're curious about paper. This book I just started. I forgot that I had this book in my stash, and I was looking for a book to start this weekend. And I thought it was appropriate given the time of year it is. It's called The Witches, Salem 1692, and it's by Stacy Schiff. And this book is absolutely unputdownable. And if that's not a word, it is now. Because, you know, I make up my own language. I mean, it is an account of the Salem Witch Trials, but it goes into so much more depth. Because the problem with the Salem Witch Trials is mo most of what we know, there's not a conclusive written history of the Salem Witch Trials. Like, we don't know that much about the people who were accused of being witches. We know who they were, but we don't know what kind of people they were, why they necessarily, or why they would have been accused of being witches. And this book kind of takes a look at the socioeconomic uh,
background that people in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony had, uh, what kind of impact their religion had on them, um, what kind of physical impact the weather and the, the just the brutal force of New England in the winter time had on them, and just basically how the psychological and sociological and economic impacts of being at the mercy of Native Americans and being in a place where they didn't know, you know, they didn't know anything about the place when they arrived. Just kind of like how the, the how there was so much more to the witch trials than just a bunch of pissed off teenagers saying, oh, well, Goody Proctor is a witch and I saw her dancing naked with the devil in the woods, you know. There had to be reasons why these things happened. And of course, you know, everybody throughout history has tried to explain the witch trials away. I personally like Arthur Miller's take on it, that it was just a bunch of spoiled bread teenagers trying to cause trouble. Um, or, you know, I've heard that there were, it, it was food, it was like a massive case of food poisoning because the rye crops got, it was air god poisoning and they all started having hallucinations and things. And I think that this book is very, very fascinating. She um, is actually a Pulitzer Prize winner for a book she wrote about Cleopatra which I haven't read, but I think it would be good. But it says, clear-eyed and sympathetic shift makes the complex seem simple, crafting a taut narrative that takes in religion, politics, folklore, and the intricate texture of daily life in Massachusetts Bay. The particular attention paid to those wonder-working women and girls who chose this moment to blow apart the Puritan utopia they helped to found. And I think I must have it was published last year, so I think I must have just thought it sounded fascinating, but I'm up to the part now where they've arrested Tichaba and her husband as witches, and they said that basically from the little bit of the trial transcripts, you could tell Tichaba at some point was just like, you know, at some point she was so worn down by the repeated questioning that she was like, oh yeah, yeah, I slept with the devil, I, I, you know, I can fly a broomstick through the woods, you know, she finally just gave up and said, well, you know, like these people would think I'm a witch, so, you know, she like embellished her story, obviously, to just kind of dig at them, and they didn't get it, you know, they took it seriously. But it's a very, very fascinating book, I have to admit. Um, I really had a hard time putting it down. The only reason I put it down last night was because I almost fell asleep reading it, but it's very good. And I think that the witch trials, it's so easy to assume that those came out of the fact that these people were very backward thinking, but they weren't. For their time, they were very, they were very modern, because if you think about it, the Puritans came to this country because they were ticked off about the Catholic Church in England, the Anglican Church, the, the state having a part of a say about religion, which is why, of course, we have separation of church and state, which is such a sticky wicket to begin with. But it's just, and I mean, I've lived through brutal Massachusetts winters in, in, the, in the, you know, 21st century, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, I can't imagine what it must have been like in the 17th century to try to get through a brutal winter. And I mean, we can have some vicious storms. I mean, more Easter's come through. Uh, we have very few ice storms, but the ones we've had have been bad. We can have snow as early as October. Um, you know, and I mean, if you think about trying to scrape out an existence on the east coast of Massachusetts, which the weather gets even wilder out towards Boston. But it also talks about how Samuel Parris, who was the, um, the leader of the church in Salem, he was very universally despised because he was just kind of a jackass. He was a young guy. He was like 38 or 39 when he was assigned his church. And he had gone from being like a failed merchant to being a clergyman, which was kind of not the norm because usually a clergyman failed and ended up being merchants of some type. And he like rubbed everyone the wrong way. And it was his daughters who started the witch trial accusations. Um, and so there's speculation that maybe his family had it in for some of the people who were accused and like they just concocted this because well, you know, if I say it was witchcraft, it was witchcraft because I'm a man of God and I would know a witch when I see one. But it's just really interesting. It's a very, very interesting book and 
I didn't expect for a nonfiction book about the witch trials to read so fast paced and brisk, but it's very, it reads like a pop boiler almost, but that's a really good book. Those are the two that I'm focusing on right now. I have a couple on the Kindle. I just started reading Ann Applebaum's book, Iron Curtain, about the history of the early Soviet Union, um, which, while that sounds incredibly dry, isn't. Um, I've mentioned before on my videos that I'm fascinated by all things Russian, and I have no clue why, because that's not my ethnic background. But I just find everything about Eastern Europe um, imperialist Russia. I've got a book in my stash that I'll start later on this year that's about Catherine and Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth being Catherine the Great's mother. And how she she was kind of like an early helicopter mom because Catherine was actually not Russian. She was German. And she was minor wealth in a little teeny, teeny little German principality nobody had ever heard of even back then. And through that, through those connections and through her mother, she became Empress of Russia. Um, and I find her a fascinating character anyway, but I find it fascinating the relationship Catherine and Elizabeth had, because like I said, Elizabeth was kind of one of those stage moms who put her daughter out there because she wanted her daughter to be wealthy because then she could be too. Um, but I think... The Anne Applebaum book is going to be interesting. I think her books get a little too scholarly, though, because I read the book she wrote called Gulag, which was an exhaustive history of the system of the Gulags from the time of the late, the, the last czars all the way through the Cold War. And it was interesting, but honestly, and I'm not trying to sound like an intellectual snob when I say this, but I have read the book. I read volume one of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, that was actually a much better account because he lived it. It was much more personal. It wasn't as dry and just like spitting out facts. It was, he had been in the gulags. He barely survived them. And I never got around to reading volume two. Maybe someday I will. But I remember I was reading volume one of the Gulag Archipelago years ago. And it was just a much better book. So I don't know how I'm going to like the Anne Applebaum book about the Iron Curtain. I did just finish... Um, a book by Konstantin Pleshkov called There Is No Freedom Without Bread, which was about the downfall of the Soviet Union, and it really did kind of blow, blow apart my opinions of it, having lived through that time, because I was 15 in 1989, and of course, back then it was all Gorbachev and Reagan, right? I mean, they were the ones who did all the doing, but actually, there were a lot more players who should have gotten a lot more credit for the downfall of communism than they did. Uh, Baklav Pavel, who was, um, you know, a very anti-Soviet leader, and I believe he was the leader of Czechoslovakia, if my memory serves me correctly. And then, of course, Lech Walesa, the Polish Solidarity Union labor movement that came out of that. He had, they had, you know, there were a lot of people who had a lot more to do with it than we ever learned. But, of course, our history you know, America wanted to be the ones who stopped godless communism, so, you know, and I don't think Reagan and Gorbachev even got along quite as well as history wanted us to think they did, but if you want to read a book that kind of blows apart all your preconceived notions about the end of the Cold War, that's a good one. Um, I did recently finish that one. Um, so those are the three books I'm reading right now. Um, and hey, I have a crap ton more books to read. I don't really read as much nonfiction as it seems like. I mean, I do. I equally divide my time between fiction and nonfiction, but I can't remember the last fiction book I read, honestly. I've been into a nonfiction group the past couple of years, um, mostly World War II oriented, um, which reminds me, I am slogging my way through. Um, War and Remembrance. But that, I, I read Winds of War, and I remember reading it and thinking that, I because it's a massive book, it's like an 800-page book or something, and I remember thinking, well, because Bill and I had watched the miniseries through Netflix, um, and I thought, well, you know, I want to read the books. And I remember the miniseries, I remember War and Remembrance being on when I was in high school, 
It was a TV miniseries done by Dan Curtis, who did Dark Shadows. And I vaguely remember the part in where they're taking in all the prisoners into the concentration camp, and there's this little girl who gets freaked out by one of the dogs. And her mother is freaked out too, but she's trying to calm her child down. She goes and pulls a like an apple blossom or something off of a tree and gives it to her daughter. And then they're all rushed out. And then the next scene you see, the dead little girl's body is laying in a wheelbarrow where she's been gassed. And she's still holding the flower. And that's like the only thing that I can remember from watching more and remember it's when I was a teenager. But I went back and I watched Winds of War, A More in Remembrance with Bill, and I decided I wanted to read the books. And I read Winds of War a couple of years ago, and I started More in Remembrance last year, late last year. But I think because it deals more with like the concentration camps and what the main characters who were in that part of the story went through, it's very hard to read. I can't read it, but it's so much at a time because it's just such, it's a much more emotional book because the um, war, uh, Winds of War is more like the beginning, Hitler start, when Hitler takes over Poland. Um, it, it, it ends with Pearl Harbor and America getting into it. So it's not, I mean, it was a beautiful, well-written book. I'm not knocking Herman Woke. It's just that War and Remembrance is more the actual wartime, the war in Europe, um, centering around this Jewish family who's trying to get out, and of course they can't, and they end up at Theresienstadt, which was the ghetto that, they called it the Paradise Ghetto, and it was the one that anytime they needed to parade the Red Cross through and say, oh, but we're nice to the Jewish people, we don't treat them badly, they would clean it up and send the Red Cross through and then go right back to treating them like shit after the Red Cross left. So there's a lot of very descriptive passages that are very beautifully written. It's just very hard to, it's emotionally hard to read that book because you can only read certain chunks of it at a time. Um, so, and I think that Herman Wolf must have created a couple of the characters he created as like the, not comic relief, but like the lighter side of the story because it just gets so, so heavy. But it's a beautifully written book. It's just taken me a while to get through it because it's a long one too. And yeah, I know how it ends because I watch the movies, but it's just, wow, it's really deep. It's really, really deep. So that's it for books. Um, as far as movies, like I said, I recorded a bunch of stuff over the weekend that, you know, I mean, I've seen them before. I mean, it's not like um, I haven't seen Rio Lindo or, or Vertigo before. But I would much rather watch a movie like that to freak myself out than these slasher films. Like, I found out they're making another movie based on the original The Ring movie that came out from Japan years ago. And I'm like, okay, how many times can that mutated, you know what, crawl out of the tape and kill someone? I mean, how many times can you tell that? But I don't think there was ever a Hitchcock movie I didn't like except for Marnie, but that was just because Tippi Hedren playing a sexually abused and psychologically abused psychopath just did not appeal to me. And I tried to like the movie because Sean Connery was in it, but I think that's the only Hitchcock movie I don't like. Um, but I started watching Vertigo. And I had forgotten how creepy that is. It's like they think she's the she's possessed by the spirit of her dead great grandmother or something. And then of course Jimmy Stewart. I mean, he's a totally unrepentant whack, wacko in that movie because he becomes obsessed with her. He's a he's a private detective asked by one of his friends from his college days to investigate his friend's wife because she's disappearing for long hours at a time. Doesn't know where he doesn't know where she's been. You know, and then he starts following her around and figures out that she must be possessed by the spirit of her dead grandmother. And then, of course, she kills herself and he comes in to, you know, he comes in and meets another woman who's a dead ringer for her. And Kim Novak and Jimmy Stewart played it beautifully off of each other, but it's just like, I don't think I've ever seen another Jimmy Stewart role where he was such a jerk. 
well, not a jerk, but he was like a creep, you know, like he became an obsessive stalker boy the more he got into the relationship with Madeline and then her doppelganger later in the movie. But um, that one's a good one. Um, but then Bill wanted to watch Rear Window, and Rear Window was one of those, like, what would you do if it happened, you know? I mean, and first of all, you'd have to, okay, the point of the movie is he's got a broken leg, he's been laid up off work, all he can do, because he's bored out of his skull, is sit and watch people in the apartment in the apartment block across the street from him. You know, watch his neighbors, watch their lives. He sees all the different goings on in all the different windows of the apartment. And then he eventually thinks he sees someone get murdered. And, how, and I mean, it's the whole thing of, well, what would you do? Because if you call the cops, well, they're going to say, well, you were a lawyer and you shouldn't have been watching. You're a peeping Tom. You know, and then you get in trouble. But... And, it, the, and Rear Window was actually remade year, a few years ago, well, probably more like 10 or 12 years ago now, with Christopher Reeve. It was the first movie back after his bad accident, his worst back writing accident. And I remember seeing that one, and I thought that one was cool, too, because they changed that one up a bit. It wasn't just the guy taking suitcases out of the, out of the apartment at all weird odd hours of the night and like, what's in the suitcase. It was more like the guy was an artist and he killed his girlfriend and then chopped her up and put her in the sculptures he was making or something to that effect. But I'm a sucker for the originals. I was going to film Psycho, but I'm not in the mood to watch Psycho. Although Psycho, the first time I watched Psycho scared the crap out of me. I couldn't take a shower for about a week without needing someone in the house with me. If I'd been by myself, I couldn't have taken a shower. But, um... So, yeah, I was watching those movies yesterday. I also watched Terminator 3, which, like I said, for what it was, it was an all right movie. I mean, it was just how many ways can you blow things off, basically. But it was kind of interesting. I mean, I think it was kind of interesting that he took the whole, oh, well, you can't, you can't stop Skynet. You can only survive it. Because I guess he was trying to say, you know, you can't mess with the past. Because if, if you mess with the past or the future, then, you know... And I guess it's true. If if John Connor had eventually been able to destroy Skynet, then the other two movies would have never existed. So I guess maybe he wrote himself into a time traveling like whole thing where he had to get out of it. But I'm not sure what I thought. I mean, I guess that's the only way it could end was that John Connor had to accept his fate, and that he and Catherine Brewster had to get married and have kids and be leaders in the resistance. But. Anyway, I mean, I watched that. I don't know why I watched that. Um, I also found on YouTube, and it took me right back to my childhood. I don't know what I, how I even came across it, but I found one of my favorite old school cooking shows from the 80s. Now, I've always said I was a, a cooking show junkie before there was ever Food Network or Cooking Channel. I love to watch them. Still do. But I've been watching them since I was a kid, and one of the ones I watched was called Cook and Cheat. And I recently came across 13 episodes of it on YouTube. And I didn't realize it was nationally syndicated because it was out of Roanoke, Virginia, which was only about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes west of where I grew up. But it was two of the funniest guys. And I mean, it reminds me of the way my husband and his best friend in high school probably would have been had they done a cooking show. But I went back and rewatched some of the episodes and just laughed my head off. And it was much more adult humor than I realized at the time. I mean, they kept it clean, but you could tell that where they were going sometimes was not. And I just, I went right back to my childhood because the show, the show premiered in like 82, so I would have been eight. But I probably watched it when I was like 11 or 12. Along with all of the old staples, you know, Yan Can Cook and Julia Child and Graham Care and, you know, all of them. So I was just, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that little trip down memory lane with the um, old cooking show. But things have been pretty quiet. Oh, I suppose I should tell you about the outcome of the football game. Um, they made it to Florida. And Saturday, of course, the weather wasn't too great. It did 
pour down rain for like, you know how like it does in Florida, it'll like, especially when the tropical pattern goes through across the state, it'll rain for like 10 minutes and then stop kind of thing. Well, we lost 24 to 7, but, and as bad as that sounds, it was really much better than it could have been. And it was probably much, much worse for Florida that they only beat us by 17. The point spread, we were at plus 36, which means we were 36 point underdogs. And I don't know, there's, there's the whole Las Vegas concept of over-unders and point spreads. And I think the over-under is like, if you bet on the under, you're betting, like say, like say the over-under is 35. You're betting, if you bet on the under, you're betting that the combined total points of the game will be under 35. And if you vote on the over, you're betting that the combined total points of the game would be over 35. And then the point spread is the difference between the scores. So we were we were supposed to be 36 point underdogs as far as the odds makers and the bookies and all that, but we only lost by 17. So we beat the spread, which is kind of always a fun thing to do because then you can imagine there's a lot of people that bet against you who did not like that outcome. And um, so, yeah, so there was that. Um, we just really looked a lot better on both sides of the ball. Um, I think part of what that has to do with is that we have a new strength and conditioning coach who was actually a coach who knows his stuff. He came from South Carolina last year, University of South Carolina, or as I call him, the other USC, because not Southern Cal, but it's USC anyway. And um, he is really, really good at his job. And whereas the previous strength coach, he was into all the strength fads and everything, but he didn't work with the kids in the way that he should have. And we would, you know, we couldn't get through a game. Our guys would be falling out, cramping up. We couldn't get through a game. You know, they had no conditioning. He was all, the former strength coach was all about the strength. Like he bought this thing. I swear to God, it looked like an oil drum or it looked like a drum from one of those old, you know, like Love Canal or something. One of those big hazardous material tin metal drums. And it was like, it weighed like 500 pounds. And the whole thing was it had, it had arms on it. Like it was a person and you had to like try to go underneath it and pick it up and see how far you could carry it. And he was into all that kind of crap, like the world's strongest man stuff. But strength means nothing without conditioning. You could be the strongest person on the team, but if you can't run a hundred yards without passing out, you're screwed. So I really think that our new strength coach has put a lot of emphasis on the um, um, coordinating, you know, the strength and the conditioning. And we looked a lot stronger. Um, we look bigger this year, you know. Um, we made it through the game without anybody getting hurt, um, which surprised me, honestly, because <coughs> the Florida guys were so much bigger than we were. But, but I think that's testament to the conditioning. And kids were not falling out. One Florida player fell out with a cramp, but none of our guys did, which is a testament to the hydration and working with the kids on keeping them hydrated before the games. Because really, the one thing that infuriates me is seeing kids fall out with cramps. There's no excuse for that. You should be adequately hydrated before the game. You know, that should just be, that's a given. I mean, you're out there running around like a banshee. You know, you should be hydrated. And there's no excuse for falling out with cramps as far as I'm concerned. So I thought our strength and conditioning looked better. And I think... You know, we've had some coaching changes over the course of the past year. Uh, we, our quarterback coach went to University of Maine to be the offensive coordinator, and we lost our defensive line coach just to life choices. He decided he wanted to be with his son more and retired. Um, and then one of our other guys quit to take a job with the Redskins. So. You know, through attrition, we gained some new coaches, and I honestly think that's been for the best because finally, and this is going to sound weird, finally we look like we're playing together as a team, like both sides of the ball are equally balanced and equally good. I think that was always consistency with the whole team was our problem. You know, if the offense had a really great day, then our defense sucked eggs, and our, if our defense was on, our offense couldn't get anything done. So I feel like offense, defense, and special teams, all three are kind of, they're meshing better now. And I even noticed that during camp. 
So, you know, I mean, there was a debate on Twitter about is there such a thing as a moral victory? It depends. If you're a coach, if you're like Coach Whipple, you say, no, we still lost. You know, we didn't win. So, and coaches can't, well, I don't think coaches can be a, be good coaches and believe in moral victories. I, however, tend to believe in them because I think there's more out of playing as hard as you can in a rough game that you're not supposed to win than just the points. So I personally think that it was a moral victory. Um, found out today on Twitter that we knocked Florida out of their top 25 in the Associated Press media poll. So they're no longer in the top 25 in the country. Um, in the coaches poll, they still are, but the one that's more important as far as the standings and everything for the postseason is the um, media poll, not the coaches poll. So I was like, hey, that's good. You know, anytime you can knock a team off their pedestal. Uh, so they got back at 4 o'clock in the morning. Bill had to work. He worked till 6. He tried to get two hours of sleep in the locker room, but he told me the Gatorade machines kept coming on. So just when he would drift off to sleep, there'd be this grinding. And so he was in rough shape Sunday. But I went out to pick him up. I didn't want him driving home because he only had two hours of sleep in nearly 48 hours. So, <clears throat> so I went out and picked him up. Um, Sunday he was doing better after he got some sleep. I mean, yesterday he was doing better after he got some sleep. So um, he's doing better. If you could just get kids not to log in as him on their computers, he'd be all set. But that's another, that's another story altogether. And yesterday I went to yoga. I um, my yoga studio. They actually have um, during the week they have a morning and an afternoon session. Um, the afternoon sessions like from 5:45 to 7 in the summer and 4:30 to 5:45 in the fall. Um, but that session was canceled yesterday because the instructor was going to be um, was going to be out of town. So the morning one was the only one, and I should have realized with that being the case, it was going to be crowded. Um, and I I'm not a person who's concerned with personal space. Okay, I'm a huggy, touchy feely kind of person. So it sounds ridiculous for me to say this, and quite frankly, if you aren't a touchy feely kind of person and you guard your personal space pretty close to the vest. You probably wouldn't like me when you meet me because I'm a very huggy, touchy-feely kind of person. But I don't like crowded yoga studios because I feel like it's an invasion of your personal meditative space and your personal, you know, because I, I view yoga as like a way to clear out my head and kind of just get my head screwed on straight. And there were 13 of us counting the instructor. Now, you have to realize my yoga studio is in a strip mall um, kind of thing. So it's a very small room anyway. I think before it became the yoga studio, it was, um, I think it was like one of those card game gamer uh, stores, you know, like where the kids go and sit and play their card games and stuff. So it's not a very big facility. But we made it happen. We got 13 of us squeezed in there and got a, a yoga session. Now, on Monday and Tuesday mornings, it's vinyasa yoga, which it, I, I describe it as like aerobic yoga. It's flow yoga. So hatha is like the classic type of yoga, and that's more pose-oriented. You do the poses. You take yourself through the poses, but it's a slow pace so that you can focus on the pose. And vinyasa is more like, you know, you go through all these different sets, but it's much more aerobic. And you do work up a sweat doing vinyasa. And it kicks my butt every time I do it. And I have to say, there's this new, she's, her instructor's integrating some new poses she's recently learned into, into the uh, session. And there's this one that's called eight point position. I swear, it's crazy. You're on your hands and knees, right? And you curl your toes underneath you like you're gonna go up into a downward facing dog. But instead of doing that, you've got your, it's eight points of contact with the mat. Where your feet are one and two, your knees are three and four, and your hands are five and six. 
well, so what's the rest of your body that you can get on the map? Well, it's your chest bone seven and your forehead's eight. So, but you're not supposed to have your hips on the mat. Your butt's supposed to basically be up in the air and your forehead and your chest are supposed to be on the floor and making contact. And that's like the seventh and eighth point of contact on the mat. And I have no earthly idea how I'm supposed to do that. Because it's like when I put my, try to get my chest to the floor, my butt wants to follow. Now, of course, when you do that pose, then you go straight down into a, a cobra, and then you go back up into a downward facing dog and stuff. But it's just one of the most awkward feeling things. I mean, and it must look pretty awkward, all of us with our butts up in the air trying to get down on the floor otherwise. And I have to tell you, between like all the, the planks and the downward facing dogs and all that, my triceps are killing me today. It's like, I, and my rib cage, like all right through the side of my, like right here in my rib cage is just so sore. I can barely move. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if you get some toning in your arms, because like my arm hurts right here. Well, if I get my tricep toned up, then maybe I won't get that chicken wobble that all women dread when they're older. You know, like maybe if I can tone up this, then it'll be better for me in the long run. And I'm like, no, it's just a way to justify the fact I can't lift my arm over my head today. So I think I'm going to go take a hot shower and just like take a leave and just kind of veg. And I mean, it's very good for me, I think, but I realize when I do that sort of thing, what kind of limited range of motion I have with my neck problems. But I actually have biceps for the first time in my life, which I feel like I've gotten from doing all the upper body work because... Yeah, I used to not be able to hold a plank for more than a few seconds, but I can plank pretty well now, and I can actually do push-ups because I have more upper body strength. So I feel like yoga's been great for me. I've been doing it two years, but sometimes it's like, remind me why pain is a good thing, because this, this can't be a good thing. And my husband jokes around with me. I've got to get him to do the, the cross-stitch quiz, because... I'm telling you, it would be hysterical. He would just be playing up to it to, to, to get everyone to laugh. But he told me, he said, you know, I think the word vinyasa is Hindi for, have you seen my spleen? Or is my colon supposed to look like that? So, yeah. So that was fun. But I did that, and then, like I said, I went out to practice, and that was about it for the day. I'm kind of worried about the operations director, though. It, it sounds so strange to put it this way but he and I have really bonded in a way that I haven't bonded with some of the other coaches only because given what I know about his past health history and things I mean he was the offensive line coach when coach Whipple was here the first time around and hired us hired Bill and you know brought us up here and then of course when coach Whipple went to take the job in 2003 with the Steelers Coach Gorham left because, you know, coaching is a good old boys network. You're going to want to bring people in who know your coaching styles and strategies and everything. So usually when there's a new head coach, all the other coaches either leave or get let go. Um, so Coach Gorham ended up going to Sacred Heart in Fairfield, Connecticut, and he was the head coach there for, you know, since then. And then in 2011, he got real sick with what he thought was pneumonia. But it turned out he had pulmonary fibrosis, and he had the idiopathic kind. So they could not tell him how he got it. Sometimes pulmonary fibrosis comes from exposure to chemicals in the workplace, or they, it can be genetic, but and then there's the idiopathic kind where they can't tell you diddly squat about why you have it. But it's one of those that you can't, you can't stop it. And some people progress slowly through it over a course of years, and some people go downhill rapidly. And sadly, he was the one who went downhill rapidly. And he ended up in March of 2012 having to have a double lung transplant. Um, and I don't know if y'all remember, if anyone here in America remembers back in 2012 in the winter when it was all those epic Midwestern tornadoes. Well, his lungs came from a donor who died in one of those tornadoes. 
and he barely got the lung transplant in time. I mean, he was at death's door. Now, he was very, very lucky and blessed. I think it was such a miracle. His wife is the cardiac transplant coordinator at Yale University Hospital. Of course, hearts and lungs, different things, but at least she knew how the whole transplant system worked. And they got him to the Cleveland Clinic, and he was actually in a coma for three weeks. Um, they were not sure they were going to do the transplant because they thought he was in death's door, but he rallied. And he ended up having the transplant. And the scary thing was he was so oxygen deprived before the surgery that he ended up having to have both his legs amputated because he had oxygen deprivation in his extremities and he basically got gangrene and had to have his legs amputated below the knee. And he almost lost his right hand, but they, were man they managed to save his hand, thank God, poor man. I mean, with everything it's been through. So, you know, it was funny because when we were coming back, when everybody was coming back after the purge, after the, la the previous coach was fired, um, one of the, one of Will's friends said, well, you know, Paul Gorham nearly died a couple years ago, right? And we were just, and I was so shocked. And I was like reading this story online and I was just sitting there with tears streaming down my face. And I didn't even really know him that well at the time. It was just, all I could think of was lung transplant, my niece with cystic fibrosis, she could someday need a lung transplant, and just how much of an inspiration he is to me that he survived in the you know, this far out, it's like four years post-transplant for him. He's doing well, um, as well as he can be. I mean, of course, his health is always going to be a very fragile thing from now on. But at least he's still with us, and it's such a miracle that he's still with us. And I remember, like, at the first signing day party at the, at the, local, um, at the local bar and grill, the first, when I saw him, I mean, I just walked up to him and I just gave him like the biggest hug and I couldn't even say anything and I nearly burst into tears. <laughs> but he and I have bonded a lot over the past two years. He's he's the kind of guy I would call, I would consider like an uncle. Um, you know, I mean, my parents are only children, so I never had any aunts or uncles. But if I did have an uncle, I would think of Paul as like my uncle. He's he's um, a great guy and. You know, I mean, I think the hardest part of all the, his health trouble was that he couldn't coach anymore. And Sacred Heart's another on my list of schools that I can't freaking stand because instead of giving him the chance to resign due to medical reasons, they fired him, which I think is unconscionable. You know, he damn near died. You're going to fire him. He didn't ask to get sick, you know. But anyway, so he came back to work for us because he and Coach Whipple have been tight, like, brothers for years and he's the operations director but sometimes he'll go sit out and watch practice he'll sit out on the balcony of the and you know I mean ever since he came back I've always gone up to check on him and I mean he knows I'm checking on him I try not to make it look like I am but you know just to make sure that he's okay and yesterday something was wrong and Oh, my little cardinal. I keep have my cardinal over there on my feeder. Louie's been quite chatterboxy lately, but it's cool because I always know when he's there. But anyway, so Coach Gorm's from Maine, and he has that very crusty New England, acerbic sense of humor, very sarcastic. I think that's why we get along so well because I'm kind of one of those sense of humor, you know, like, my sense of humor is kind of like I call BS on things, and I kind of I kind of have a sarcastic sense of humor, sort of, and I think that's why we get along so well because we're similar in, in that respect. Uh, but he just was not himself yesterday, and Bill's afraid that he's worried that he's going to be let go by the administration because they've been purging a lot of people, and it's probably not nice to put it on video, but I feel like they've targeted a lot of people who are of a certain age. And he's like in his mid to late 50s. I mean, he's probably like 55, 56. Actually, no, I think, yeah, he's probably like 56. And, you know, I mean, what would he do if he didn't have this? This is like his lifeline because it was, football was just cut out from under him when he got sick. 
but I went up to see him yesterday, you know, and gave him a big hug. I was like, hi, coach, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Nobody else does. And it was just the way he said it. He sounded so bummed out when he said it. And as the younger generation would say, that got me in the feels. I was like, oh, coach, that's horrible. And so I was like, well, coach, you know, I, I care and I'll always ask. But I just wonder what's going on. I wonder what's going on. I hope it's not anything too drastic. Because normally he's much more outgoing than that, gregarious and sarcastic. He's like a crusty New Englander, but it's like I told Bill. His crust isn't that that thick. It's a very thin veneer of crust and he's a marshmallow underneath. But So I hope he's okay. That did kind of worry me. And then I was talking to Bill about it and he said, well, come to think of it, Paul was not himself yesterday because I guess he wanted to watch video. And he asked Bill if he could set up some video in the auditorium and Bill said, sure. And he set it up and later he walked by the auditorium and Coach Gorham was sitting there in the dark watching film. So something's up there and I hope it's not what I think it is, but so I'm worried about him, but other than that, we're all doing all right. My niece is being checked in, in the hospital as we speak, I'm sure. So, you know, I was going to call, but with it being as crazy as it will be trying to get her checked in and all, I think I'll call tomorrow night. And I think at this point, I have talked to, I've talked her ears off. It's a minute and ten. It's an hour and ten minutes into this video. So if I want any chance of it getting posted before tomorrow, I better hush up and go and convert it and start uploading it. But I hope I haven't bored you all to death. I um, just wanted to show you what little bit of progress I made over the weekend. And until next time, I don't quite know when that's going to be, probably in a week or so. I wish you a happy life and happy stitching, and I will talk to you soon.